and welcome to CyberFocus, your source for international business news. I'm Sarah Reeves, and with me today is Michael Gary, a faculty lecturer from Maastricht University in the Netherlands, and also a fellow in European Studies at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Gary, thank you for joining us today. Yes, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here at Indiana. Excellent. I'm glad that you're enjoying your time here, even if it's a little rainy today. Yeah, well, you know, I'm Irish, so we, this is par for the course. <laughs> but even, even the weather in Ireland is never this bad, I think. <laughs> we, we do get some sunny days as well. Well, you missed it earlier. Apparently so, yeah. Uh, you recently wrote uh, a big, well, you co-authored a big debate that was talking about uh, Britain, UK's rocky relationship with the European Union. And it's easy to think that this is a more recent development, uh, the Eurozone crisis and other ongoing issues. but. You're talking about this being an issue basically from when the UK joined the Union. Can you talk a little bit about what the UK's relationship is with mm. the European Union and why it's been such a love-hate relationship? Yeah, uh, I don't know how long this interview will last. So <laughs> we have, it, the, the relationship goes back a very long time. Uh, I'll try and be concise. Yes, I wrote a, an op-ed recently, a large, well, an extended op-ed debate type with uh, Kevin Lees, the f editor of Suffragio, the foreign policy blog. And in that, basically, we try and reassess the British relationship with Europe. Uh, most recently, David Cameron, the current British Prime Minister, has made it quite clear that yeah, he wants to have a referendum uh, on continued British membership. He made this announcement back in January of this year. Um, and the date has been set sometime in 2017, so sometime in the middle of the next parliament, there's British elections in 2015. And if he's re-elected and the Conservatives are re-elected, then he's going to go to the people. Um, before that, he wants to renegotiate Britain's relationship. So this is kind of a grey area at the moment. The British Foreign Office is going through this kind of a, a stock take of what we can try and get back from Europe, you know, this pulling back and mm -hmm. opting out of more areas, largely on the issues of, you know, prisoners in jail in Britain have the right to vote, according to the Court of Human Rights, European Court of Human Rights. He doesn't think that this is right. And there's a lot of pressure on him from his backbenchers, from the UK Independence Party, um, who want less Europe and less involvement on the social side. Uh, the problem for him is that there's not, he doesn't have that many supporters within the European Union who want to facilitate this renegotiation. Um, because, you know, if, if, if one member state starts pulling back and renegotiating, well, there's 27 other member states <laughs> who also could go down that road. So he doesn't have that many supporters within the EU. Angela Merkel, the current German Chancellor, is mildly open to looking at what she could do for him. Um, Mark Rutte, the Dutch Prime Minister, is also quite keen to maybe help David Cameron out, but the rest are not so keen to, uh, to help Britain largely because Britain has not been that cooperative on other areas of mm -hmm. EU integration. So. There, there, there seems to be, uh, within the next 24 to 48 months, you will see uh, a lot more movement on the British question. Um, and we've, had, we've lived with the British question now <laughs> since, I suppose, the 1950s. Um, uh, Hara, Winston Churchill, you know, really encouraged Europeans to go down the road of integration, uh, but not with Britain. You know, you can do it, but we, we don't really feel the necessity to do this. You know, we won the war, uh, you need to do this uh, to try and prevent wars amongst yourselves, the French and the Germans in particular. Um, and then they embarked upon this process of integration. And uh, the British were hugely uh, skeptical uh, in the 50s. But then by 1961, they applied to join, for, uh, join uh, uh, the present day European Union, what was then known as the European Economic Community. And it took a decade to try and get in. Uh, a lot of antagonism from French President Charles de Gaulle, uh, who vetoed the application, uh, the British application twice, and by extension prevented Ireland and Denmark from joining because they were kind of tied to the coattails of the British application. Um, and in 73 they join. Uh, the first EU enlargement, Britain, Denmark, Ireland join. And you know, there should have been some excitement and euphoria. <laughs> After a decade, uh, we have you know, move the EU from six member states to nine. Um, but very quickly then the, uh, the optimism and the excitement disappears. And um, the British general election of 1974, um, the Conservatives lose power, the pro-European Prime Minister Edward Heath is gone, 
and uh, Harold Wilson, the Labour Prime Minister, incoming Prime Minister, campaigns um, in the election uh, that he promises that you know if he's elected, he will have a referendum. He will renegotiate the deal and have a referendum. So immediately. Immediately. And immediately there is bad blood, <laughs> you know, within the within the community. Um, and there's a sense of deja vu today about this. You know, David Cameron is saying the same thing. If you re-elect me in 2015, we will renegotiate and have a referendum. Harold Wilson back in 74 said the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, interestingly, this is the 40th anniversary, 2013, of the first enlargement. So it's like, I'm not sure if it's 40 years in a marriage is a very long time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you saw in 1960s, there was some pre-wedding jitters between Britain and the EU. Um, now I, I'm kind of thinking that it's more the marriage is coming to an end. That, you know, we are either happy couples or unhappy couples, I should say, don't generally stay together. Yeah. Um, so now I think, uh, as Kevin and I uh, argued in that, in that piece, uh, published in e -Sharp, that it is now more a question of separation or divorce. Um, the relationship is not amorous. It never was. Uh, every British Prime Minister since the 1970s has felt almost a national duty to attack the integration process. Um, most famously, I suppose, Margaret Thatcher, mm -hmm. um, uh, who immediately wanted uh, her money back. So every member state pays something into the EU. Mm -hmm. She felt that they were paying, Britain was paying too much and she wanted a rebate. And that, that whole argument lasted for five years, 79 to 84. Every EU summit, she and her handbag diplomacy <laughs> argued for a rebate and she got it eventually. Uh, John Major had huge problems with the single currency, opting in, opting out, major disaster there. Tony Blair wanted to bring Britain into the euro. His chancellor, Gordon Brown, said, not on my watch. Yeah. And he set down these conditions and basically they were never going to be met. So Britain will, would not join the euro. And when he became prime minister, Gordon Brown was very much against uh, and not very pro-European either. And David Cameron is continuing this tradition <laughs> of, um, uh, I suppose, euro scepticism. But again, the, diff the difference between Harold Wilson 40 years ago and David Cameron today is that uh, Harold Wilson was a member of the European community with only nine members. So it was a small club. Mm -hmm. And Harold Wilson had more uh, political capital. You know, They wanted Britain to stay in. They didn't want him to leave 24 months after joining. The Americans would have been fuming. The Americans were very much encouraging of the, the British to join. But Harold Wilson had huge opposition in the Labour Party. So he had internal opposition to membership. He had to get a good deal. And the French and the German leaders said, OK, we will throw you a bone. And he got uh, a lot of money, regional funding, mm -hmm. money to help the disadvantaged parts of the, of the UK. Fast forward 40 years later, <laughs> uh, David Cameron doesn't have the same goodwill. There are 28 member states, as well as the EU institutions, who are not very happy about renegotiation or opening this can of worms, mm -hmm. because you're opening a Pandora's box. Um, so the German leader, Angela Merkel, seems to be sympathetic, but sympathy, as we know, does not necessarily lead to policy outcomes. You can be sorry for his problems, <laughs> but, um, but his problems have expanded. He's not just dealing with his own backbenchers, who are very Eurosceptic. He's also dealing with you know, the wider political system in Britain, where the UK Independence Party is gaining traction and momentum for arguing, about, arguing for less Europe. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to cover his right flank, his far right flank, as well as the backbenchers. And that's a very hard, uh, you know, um, you can't really square that circle. And he's having huge problems in doing this. What does he do? Reluctantly, he's saying, well, we have to have a referendum. Uh, what will the outcome be? I, I don't know. Uh, well, you made some recommendations in your article. When you, mm. you kind of made this marriage analogy. Sure. And you're saying separate or divorce. Yeah. And you're saying that separation is really the best option. And you had some arguments against complete um, or divorce mm. of the UK from the Union. Can you kind yeah. of explain why you're making that argument? Yeah, I mean, I think it's in nobody's interests uh, to leave the European Union, for Britain to leave the EU. Um, as an Irish uh, citizen, I, I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that Ireland has a very important political and trade relationship with, with Britain. Mm -hmm. um, it's had it for a very long time. Uh, a lot of our exports go to Britain. 
uh, the Irish, uh, Irish exports to Britain are more than all the BRIC countries combined to Britain. Mm -hmm. Like that's huge. Yeah. Um, so if they were to leave the European Union, they leave the customs union, they leave the single market, and then anything that Ireland exports to Britain, there are, there are tariffs. And anything that Britain exports to the EU, there are high tariffs. So the, on the economic side, it's hugely important that Britain does not leave the European Union for those countries exporting. For the British themselves, the city of London, which is one of the, the world's most important financial hubs, will lose significance uh, in relation to Paris and Frankfurt mm -hmm. because they're outside the European Union then and Fra Fra uh, Paris and Frankfurt, two very, very important financial hubs, are in the European Union. So on that, on that side, it's, it's important. A an, ad an additional level of complication uh, <laughs> is, which I don't think the British public have fully grasped yet, right? They I think the British public, once they sit down in the cold light of day, uh, closer to a referendum and weigh up these options, either leaving or staying in a semi-insider status, um, they may well opt for staying in. The added complication is this new transatlantic trade and investment partnership, TTIP. Mm -hmm. TTIP, which uh, President Obama announced in his State of the Union this year, or at least he gave the green light that the Americans would now negotiate with the EU, will create the world's largest trade bloc. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about uh, massive increases in, in the long term with a comprehensive trade deal between the EU and the US. Um, we're looking at, you know, about a million jobs being created on both sides of the Atlantic. Now the Americans, depending on which assessment you look at, depending on which economist you're talking to, <laughs> the Americans come out on top of this one. You know, there's a, you know, huge amounts of investment in the US, huge amount of job creation in the US with this trade agreement. Europeans don't do, don't do too badly either. Uh, you see increases in GDP in every European country, from Greece to Ireland, from Ireland to Germany. It's, it's a win-win for everyone. Exactly. Britain also does quite well. Is a, over a, the long term, you're seeing maybe a 10% increase in GDP. You're seeing maybe 400,000 jobs. And interesting, David Cameron at the last G8 summit in Northern Ireland in, in June mentioned this, you know, on, on the fringes of the summit, you know, well, uh, a comprehensive TTIP will really benefit the British economy. But if you're not part of the European Union, you don't benefit from this. Turkey, for example, at the moment is in Washington is really lobbying hard the American administration to get them included in TTIP. Mm -hmm. The European Union says, well, you're not a member. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's an added complication. But David Cameron, may, David Cameron may well need TTIP to sell a yes vote to stay in. So leaving is the nuclear option. And I think that's in no one's interest. The European Union needs that liberal voice, that liberal trade voice that Britain has always brought to the table within the EU uh, to reduce barriers to trade, reduce tariffs to trade. And Britain has been pushing that along with Germany. Huge export nations, the Dutch are the same. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're battling that French protectionist cry. Um, so a, a European Union led by only France and Germany is not necessarily a good thing. Mm -hmm. So we need Britain's liberal trade voice. Um, the other option we argued in our op-ed in the piece was separation. Britain has always seemed to have wanted an, a semi-insider status. They want to be in, but they don't want the, the trappings of the institutions, of the European Court of Justice, of all these regulations and directives that they are you know, uh, legally obliged to implement. Mm -hmm. um, what we argue is that renegotiation is probably the best of the, the, the worst option they could that we, the most, the, the option we can really live with, or at least they can live with. Um, staying in the single market. So they have access to the single market, um, but not to the other pillars. Say, forget economic union, forget fiscal harmonization, um, forget foreign common and defense policy. Britain already has a seat at the Security Council. They don't need to deal with this European foreign policy um, uh, area. Um, forget, you know, open borders, forget Schengen. Um, so that's opting out of a huge amount of the integration process. Um, the purists in Brussels and in other European member states would say, well, listen, guys, you join a club, you accept the rules. Yeah. Uh, you knew, you didn't, you didn't walk blindly or drunkenly into this process. You walked in clear-eyed, you knew where we were going. 
you applied knowing that we were going to try to achieve an ever closer union. Um, of course, nobody ever knew what that meant, though that vague term, ever closer union. Uh, so David Cameron's task now is, yes, he, he's a realist. He sees if we leave the European Union, we are in really big trouble economically. You know, the city of London, in trouble. Um, and GDP will probably drop as a result of non-access to the common market. No, and they have, a, of course, being a member of the EU, they have preferential treatment now. Mm -hmm. um, so we argue basically that what they should do is, you know, if they can, this is, you know, big, a big ask, mm -hmm. given that David Cameron is not the most adept at negotiation. We see this with Syria and trying to get a Commons vote. You know, he, he, he needs to improve in his leadership style. But then uh, negotiating with, with 27 member states uh, would be very difficult. Uh, what he's looking for is huge. He wants to uh, pull out of certain areas that they've already committed to, uh, the Charter and Fundamental Rights, um, a lot of you know, human rights legislation that they've, they want to control from Westminster, not from Brussels. Um, and that's going to take a lot. It's going to take uh, a lot of coalition building mm -hmm. because he needs to bring on board EU partners and convince them, listen, we want to stay. I need to give the British electorate something to vote on. We're going to go for a referendum. I need something to renegotiate. I need to tell the British people, we've won here, we've won there. It has to be a victory in their mindset. Mm -hmm. And they will tick the right box on, a ref on referendum day. Um, you know, what will happen, how it's going to play out, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really uh, the million dollar question. Um, but I think the, uh, I would argue, I think this is what David Cameron is hoping, that he will get enough to pacify the backbenches and those Eurosceptics. Um, and Middle England will just simply say, you know, this is a good deal. And closer to the referendum, the City of London and all the money that they have, all those big businesses, they will be, you know, throwing money at this campaign because mm -hmm. they will know they will realize you know if we're outside of the european union we really are isolated um whatever one might think of the in integration process it's better to be on the inside trying to steer it rather than on the outside and where you've no access you've no control so the city of london will will be spending ferocious amounts of money on trying to get the campaign on, on a yes campaign to stay in um, I think that will that will ratchet up much closer to the to the to the uh, referendum day, which is still unannounced. We know it's 2017. Um, uh, and a lot can happen. A lot can happen. You know, <laughs> uh, elections are funny things. David Cameron may well lose next election. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the Labour Party and Ed Miliband, its leader, has not come out and said that he will promise the same thing. Now. Closer to the election in 2015, Ed Miliband, who may not even be leader at that stage, he's grossly unpopular, hugely unpopular in his own party, uh, you may well see the Labour Party adopting a similar position. If a significant amount of people in Britain want to vote, mm -hmm. it'll be hard for the Labour Party to deny them that. So you may well see him uh, get off the fence in the next 6 to 12 months and say, OK, if, uh, if you elect us, we will also promise a referendum in 2017. Uh, on uh, an inner out of the European Union. Um, the problem is, of course, you know, if the referendum was held today, you know, Britain would opt to leave. And is Britain an anomaly in this? Is the rest of the Union moving closer to this greater Euro integration? Or are there other um, member states that are also a little leery of this closer Union? Mm. I, I would, uh, I hate to generalize, but I would say yes, Britain really has been has been typecast as this reluctant European mm -hmm. for a very long time. Um, this predates the creation of the European Union uh, or the European Community back in the 50s. Um, there are mildly skeptic European countries, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Denmark, for example, hasn't joined the single currency. Um, Ireland has joined the single currency, but it hasn't, and, and it hasn't joined Schengen, which is this free border area. So you can fly from uh, Madrid to uh, Amsterdam and there's no passport control. You could drive and there's no passport control. Uh, it's like, you know, uh, uh, going from Reagan Airport uh, in DC to here in Indianapolis. You know, you, you, you're not asked for your passport once you exit. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're flying uh, from a European airport on the continent to London, you, are, you go to border security. 
Um, Ireland is the same. Um, th the those two countries an, have not uh, signed up. Um, Norway, you know, Norway <laughs> went to the altar twice <laughs> and, and said no, you know, a very reluctant <laughs> bride for sure, since we're on the marriage analogy. Uh, in 70, 70, 1970 to 73, they, they negotiated entry, uh, they signed the treaty, then they, they have a referendum and they say no. <laughs> and again in the 1990s, they, they, they try again. And has that been to their detriment? Do you feel that not being part of the Union is hurting Norway? No, because Norway has lots of oil. So, you know, uh, they're oil rich. Right. <laughs> uh, but they also have a kind of, a, they have a relationship with the European Union. They have access to the single market, but they have no say in how it works. Mm -hmm. They're on the outside looking in. So they have a, pr they, uh, 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 Norway and Switzerland, they have preferential deals with the European Union, but they have no seat at the table. Mm -hmm. um, Switzerland has even joined Schengen but they have no say in how the process works. So there's an open border between Switzerland and the European Union. Um, but again, there are countries that guard their, their sovereignty hugely. For, for Norway, there are a number of issues. One is fisheries. If you join the European Union, every member state has access to your fishing waters. And they have huge fish, yeah. huge fishing stocks. Um, and they don't want greedy Spanish fishermen who are notorious for overfishing going into Norwegian waters. So you've got some member states that have huge fishing fleets and the Spanish have been notoriously uh, bad for overfishing. We have, we have quotas in place, we have, we have net sizes, so you can only f you know, f catch certain types of size fish. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to respect certain fishing limits. But you know, uh, the Norwegians are like, well, no, we don't want to share. And also they're rich enough to yeah. opt out. Um, uh, the, the, the Nordic countries really uh, very much value their Nordic identity, their Scandinavian identity, mm -hmm. um, and they have held back in terms of the integration process. They, they don't really want to go down certain roads with, with the rest of the European Union. Um, single currency is one, the euro, they haven't joined um, uh, border areas, certain things that they really value their identity. And, and you wouldn't respect that in terms of cultural diversity within the EU. It's not meant to be one size fits all, mm -hmm. and that's that's been one of our problems. But so. But Britain stands alone in many ways as that country that has, is, is opting out further and further and further. Um, and this is where I say, you know, don't divorce. Many couples who are married, they, so they separate. <laughs> you know, they don't want to go down that road of, you know, a, a divorce. So just separate, you know, and you can live in a harmonious relationship, have a harmonious life. But then what kind of a, of a union do we have with, you know, the third biggest member state is on the semi-insider status. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it, it's not ideal. It's not an ideal situation, but we may well have to live with this going forward. And the union is not so fixed and rigid that we can't accommodate. And we are accommodating because we have countries in the Euro, outside the Euro, mm -hmm. in Schengen, outside Schengen. Um, so, you know, we've learned, we're, we're learning to live with this. This is not like the United States where you know, <laughs> they're all part of this system. Yeah. Um, there's no opting in, opting out of, of federal law. Well, sometimes we try. Well, exactly. <laughs> you know, you can, you can, but you'll probably end up in the Supreme Court where you're told, well, you know, toe the line. But, um, uh, you know, every member state is meant to join the euro, but, you know, there is certain flexibility in mm -hmm. when they join or uh, if public opinion is hugely against it, well, no government is going to bring, bring the euro in. So. Um, but Britain does stand alone, I think, in, 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 in this particular type of reluctance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the integration process. In your article, you talked about um, Britain's interest in free trade mm. areas. And it seems to be that the big issues related to the European Union are wanting to be part of this, this trade block and being able to trade, mm -hmm. um, and then also the, the Eurozone. And so there's a lot of things that come up that are related to economics. Mm. Are, are the social and other policy related things the issue? Is that the sticking point? Um, would having just a trade region be more effective? Um, what, what, what exactly is going mm. on here? It, this is the ideal scenario for Britain. They, they want a wide free trade area solely based on trade. Mm -hmm. Um, back in the 1950s, they proposed this free trade area, um, this FTA, between all members of what was then known as the, OSC, the OEC, which is now presently the OEC, it may, or evolved into the OECD. Um, 
So having all of these, I think there were 17 countries in the OEEC, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, and they wanted a free trade area between all of these member states. Um, the problem was that after the war, the French were, and particularly the Germans, th there were some in Germany who actually saw the benefits of a free trade area, but Konrad Adenauer wanted something that was deeper, that would tie member states together beyond simply economics. You know, there had to be a political link there as well. Um, and many in Europe saw the, the British initiative as a way to sabotage what was, at the same time it, that British, Britain proposed this free trade area in 56, 57, the continental countries were putting together the Treaty of Rome. Mm -hmm. So many thought that this was Britain trying to sabotage this, 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 this movement towards integration. Um, and even in the European Union, when they joined, Britain really has been very much pushing for reducing barriers, reducing tariffs, tariffs of trade, uh, completing the single market, which we still haven't done, you know. Um, things like transport, things like infrastructure, uh, um, you know, IT infrastructure, we're still lagging behind. Innovation, for example, we, we could do so much more within the single market, which would have the benefit of boosting trade and jobs and growth, um, but we're not, we're not there yet. And, and this is something that the British are really annoyed at. And David Cameron mentioned this in his speech in January, that we really need to focus more on finishing the single market project. Um, rather than going down the road of, of all these new policy areas. Um, but Britain has always argued for free trade. In its mind, it is an outward trading country, not just with Europe, but it has also had the Commonwealth, it had the Empire prior mm -hmm. to that. Um, and even when they were trying to join the EU in the, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, Britain was trying to have the best of both worlds. They wanted to be in the EU, but they also wanted to maintain their preferential agreements with the Commonwealth countries like New Zealand and Australia and Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so they wanted, they wanted both, but the EU and, and the member states were, and, and the EU institutions were like, well, you know, you're either joining this or you're not. You can't have a semi-insider, outsider status here. You're a member and then you should sign up to what we're, where we're going. Um, but over the years, things have changed. You know, institutions have gotten more power. The European Parliament has gotten a lot more power um, with the Maastricht Treaty, the Amsterdam Treaty, uh, Nice, and more recently with Lisbon. So the Parliament has gained in influence over mm -hmm. policy and decision making within the EU, co-decision with the Council of Ministers on issues like budget and so on, very, very important. Then we've introduced the social charter linked to the Lisbon Treaty. Mm -hmm. So now you're talking about, um, you know, issues like where divorce might be illegal in one member state, is that actually compatible with EU law and mm -hmm. the way we're moving into more of a social, a social Europe? So, or abortion and these kinds of social questions, or more pertinent to Britain, the working time directive. So if you're a doctor and you have, you know, according to EU working time directive, you can only work a certain amount of hours a week. Mm -hmm. Britain is like, well, this is crazy. You know, why can't we control, you know, how many hours a week doctors, nurses, and other health professionals can work. Mm -hmm. So this is being regulated by Brussels, but Britain wants to claw these back. Um, and ideally, and David Cameron's speech in January makes this quite clear that the ideal scenario is single market. Britain being a member of the single market, and that's it. You know, cut out the rest. Um, again, you know, this is par for, for, par for the course. This is what they've been you know, this is, this is the mindset that they've approached the project with over the last 40 years. And, and this is, as I said, that their, their 40th anniversary, their 40th <laughs> birthday, and not a very happy one, unfortunately. <laughs> so we've been talking about things at a very high country level. Mm. What does all of this mean for a business person within the union or someone who's interested in doing business in the union, but they are not, they're in a country outside of the union? Mm. Is this going to bring up any issues for them? Yes, significantly, because if you are a business owner in, in London or in, in, in Newcastle or in Edinburgh um, and you're exporting, you're, you're, you're exporting and your main market is, say, I don't know, France or Lithuania or Poland, mm -hmm. at the moment there's free movement, free movement of goods and services. So when you cross into, or from, from Britain into France or um, from France into Poland uh, or into Germany, there is no customs duties. There's, you, you're not paying more uh, in taxes. Now, one of the problems for the British is that there is, there is the exchange rate between sterling and the euro. That's an, that's an issue. And for business people, they would probably would much prefer to have a single currency because you cut out 
the exchange rates. Mm -hmm. And this is one of, one of the benefits, you know, even as, a, as an Irish person who, you know, works in the Netherlands and when I go home to Ireland, uh, it's wonderful. I don't have to go and change currencies. You know, it's something we don't even think about now. Yeah. And, and this is what has made Spain so popular for Irish tourists because, you know, we have no conversion yeah. and it's wonderful. Well, and, the and, and the weather, of course, <laughs> the weather, absolutely, which yes, this is more the main reason we, that we go there. But um, so, so that has really helped. So for business people, uh, the free movement of goods and services um, within the single market is hugely important mm -hmm. um, uh, for British people exporting. And also then uh, for American companies who are setting up bases in Britain, they will be acutely conscious now and, and, and watching how this unfolds. Why would you set up a, a factory or headquarters in London or in Liverpool or wherever it is if the country is on the verge of leaving the European Union? Mm -hmm. Because they're going there because A, uh, it has a skilled workforce. They're going there secondly because uh, it's not an overly taxed regime, corporation tax wise. Um, good infrastructure links with the continent. And thirdly, it's an English speaking workforce. Nice. So, but yeah, it's fantastic. So Britain decides to leave. Uh, for argument's sake, and then you know Ireland becomes the only English-speaking country in the Eurozone, in the European Union. It's also in the Eurozone, so they will benefit somewhat from the from the blowback. But then, you know, Ireland will not benefit from having Britain outside the European Union. So, on, from a from a business standpoint, this becomes very complicated. Yeah. And also, uh, TTIP, um, the I in TTIP is investment, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So, countries, our companies. Uh, in Europe or outside of Europe who want to uh, grow and develop in, in the European Union uh, or invest uh, may well be reluctant to invest in London or in Britain um, because it, it's added to this complication, this political uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And what makes things worse is that David Cameron has set, has, has set such a long timetable. <laughs> We're talking half a decade here yeah. of uncertainty. So the speech came in January we may not have a referendum until the middle or late 2017, which is, you know, how can you put a foreign policy as important of, of a decision as this on hold? So companies will be acutely conscious of this. Um, uh, and you see, you know, uh, a lot of the American companies have headquarters in, say, the Netherlands or in Ireland, or Facebook just recently opened its uh, first server outside of North America in Sweden which will of course have problems for, <laughs> for NSA surveillance and all this regulatory issues from now on, they'll be under EU uh, jurisdiction mm -hmm. um, for data privacy. But in, but in terms of you know, um, American companies, that they will be viewing this with, with very closely in terms of uh, how this plays out. If Britain stays in uh, and secures some kind of renegotiation, that's great. Mm -hmm. But if it looks as if they're going to leave, well, you'll see a lot of you know, companies being very jittery on the subject and uh, also for British companies who they have more to lose. Uh, American and, and foreign companies are more flexible. They can just you know, pick up, pack up and move out and move across the Irish River or the Irish Channel uh, to the Irish Sea to, to Ireland, or they can go to France or they can go somewhere else within the European Union. Um, but British companies will really face huge obstacles in terms of trade. Yeah. And, if, and on the divorce issue, if Britain decided to leave the European Union and the Lisbon Treaty makes provision for this, um, a country now can leave the European Union, but how that would happen? So if Britain decided to leave, there would be, you know, you have to, you have to like disentangle Britain from the EU. And how generous would the European Union be? It sounds like it would be just as complicated as an actual divorce. Uh, yeah, it dividing would be. Your finances, dividing up your property. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the, who has custody of the kids? Ex well, it is absolutely, <laughs> and you see this also at the moment with, with, with the Scottish question and and the Scottish referendum is uh, is in a year's time, a year from yesterday, next uh, September of next year, and uh, most opinion polls say that Scotland will not leave the the union. Um, this 300-year-old union. Um, I, I'm personally in favour of, of, of an independent Scotland. I think we tend to forget that Scotland was an independent country for a very long time. But so there's huge challenges facing the British government over the next 24 to 48 months um, on domestic levels and also uh, on the European question. But certainly um, I think the, the business question, the economic question is weighing very heavy on David Cameron's mind. Mm -hmm. But I'm also kind of you know, veering on the side that once um, push comes to shove, I think the British people will see that they're making, they, they would be making, and looking at this objectively, 
uh, they will be making a major mistake um, by leaving. They have a lot more to lose um, by leaving than by staying. So for now, Britain is still part of the European Union and we still have till 2017. And there's a lot of things that can happen between now and then as we discussed and one of them is coming up very soon, which is the German elections. What, what do the elections mean for the changes for the Union over the next few years? Yeah, we have uh, the German elections and uh, on this weekend. Uh, um, they're, the election has been quite boring in many respects. It has been a very exciting elect election campaign. Uh, Angela Merkel is, is playing it very, very safe on this. The only big issue that has dominated the domestic headlines has been the, the fallout from the NSA. Mm -hmm. um, Germany was one of those countries that was most snooped upon um, uh, largely because of, you know, uh, well, for various reasons, I don't really know. I mean, there's one of the things is that, you know, the, the, there's a um, certain activity that the, the Americans are following because I think there's, there are links to 9-11, the, the people who were involved in 9-11. Um, I think, I'm not sure if whether they, they came through Germany or there was a, a link. So there, the, the NSA fallout has been very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, it has damaged certain relations between the US and Germany. Angela Merkel has tried to play this down. Um, she met uh, uh, Obama at the G20 and you know there's been a lot of uh, opposition to this in Germany largely because you know there's echoes to the Stasi past and to spying and, and East Germany. So it's a very sensitive issue. That's been the only one that's really dominated headlines in, uh, in Germany. Other than that it's been a very normal election. The result is likely to be Angela Merkel will remain as, as Chancellor. Um, it is just a question of which type of coalition uh, will emerge, mm -hmm. whether it will be a repeat of this one, uh, the FDP, the Liberals and Merkel CDU, or whether it will be a grand coalition like it was in her first term. Uh, is it likely to be a game changer for the European side? I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. Um, you know, we are currently living through this I suppose, age of austerity in Europe, um, where countries are being forced to cut back on expenditure, or raise taxes, and it's, it is hurting a lot of countries, uh, particularly the southern Mediterranean countries, uh, Ireland, and even the Dutch are, you know, making significant cutbacks in their annual budget. We're talking billions. Um, and that's, uh, that affects not only the domestic side, but it also affects how much money these countries are prepared, are able to give uh, under, say, the UN Millennium Goals. Mm -hmm. So aid to uh, developing countries is being affected as well, that's being, that's being reduced at national level, which is disappointing, but you know, this, is, this is the phase we're going through. Um, a re-election for Angela Merkel is not going to mean the end of austerity. It's not going to mean that Germany will let up on Greece and say, okay, well, you have a few more years to deal with your, uh, your problems. I think the momentum, will, will the rhetoric will stay the same. Uh, you will see the con a continuation of this, this push to reform in these countries, reform their economic systems, reform their civil service, um, reform public administration and so on, reform their taxes. Um, a greater push to collect taxes, which wasn't necessarily the case in some countries, uh, where you, you have maybe 35% of the Greek economy under the table, 20% uh, of the Italian economy is under the table, so there's major uh, structural problems that need to be tackled and rightly so. I think Angela Merkel is right to put pressure on um, certain governments. Um, I think what we will see is maybe more of a drive towards growth. This is a huge problem. Um, there's not enough talk about uh, Europe moving forward and reducing public debt um, <coughs> and reducing unemployment. So we have got about one in four Spaniards are unemployed. Uh, it's over 25% of the population. In Ireland, we've got 14.3% of the population, of a f population of 4 million people, 4.5 million people unemployed. That's unsustainable, mm -hmm. you know. Um, a lot of Irish, for example, have gone to Australia looking for, for, for work uh, because, of course, they, they're, they're experiencing a boom over there, you know, but that, that is now being reduced because, or it's coming to slightly declining because of Chinese demand for minerals is, is, is being reduced. So we have major unemployment issues uh, in Europe that need to be tackled um, because this will give rise to, uh, you know, uh, the rise of the far right and the far left. And we've seen this in many European countries, in, in, in Germany, or in, particularly in the Netherlands and in Greece, uh, in Britain. So you need to tackle these problems before they become mm -hmm. uh, unmanageable. So I think what needs to be done over the next number of years is tackling this mountain of unemployment. We are already five years into the recession, five years into this crisis. Um, 
the euro and the European Union are not going to collapse, but what we're left with in this post um, uh, apocalyptic period is a mountain of unemployment and a mountain of sovereign debt. Uh, and we, we're still trying to tackle you know, these two issues. And there seems to be you know, very few ideas and very, very little vision, really. Um, Angela Merkel wants to play it safe. She's under pressure from German voters, German savers, who don't want to go down the same road as the Americans with bond buying on a monthly basis by the Fed, which could she potentially agree to continue. Well, to exactly, <laughs> because you know the Fed wants to see more economic data before they they, they pull back on this. Um, but they're still buying bonds and they're they're still doing this. But this may well lead to inflationary problems in the long run. It would may may well affect savers. Europe, we haven't done this. We've gone down the road of austerity. So. Those who have savings are, you know, they're lucky. But for those who have got very little, they're, they've, they're even, they're, what they have is being reduced uh, in terms of unemployment welfare, unemployment benefits, welfare, and so on. Entitlements are being reduced for those who are unemployed. Mm -hmm. So there's major, major problems like that that had to have to be tackled. Um, European, some European countries thought that they would have an export-led recovery. That's assuming that the global economy picks up as well. <laughs> because the domestic market is dead in many European countries. Um, we have a mortgage crisis in some countries. In Ireland, for example, we have about 100,000 mortgages that are in arrears by more than three months. And that's really worrying, you know. Uh, they just cannot afford to pay their mortgages, which will leave, leave a huge liquidity problem with banks. So banks are gonna, you know, will they need another bailout? Um, so, you know, the post-German election, uh, environment is not going to change and alter the European uh, scene all that much. There's no magic wand or, or miracle that she's going to perform over after she's re-elected next week. We will see a continuation of this. Um, she may be bolder on the domestic side in terms of reforms in Germany, but on the European side, uh, any further bailouts will require German funding. Mm -hmm. So there is talk of, an, of another Greek bailout, maybe 10 or so billion. Um, the Portuguese may well need another helping hand. Um, luckily, Ireland, it seems, is just, is just you know, crawling out of recession right now, according to the latest economic data that was published this week. Uh, so there's, there's a glimmer of hope there, notwithstanding unemployment figures being quite high. Um, but you're still looking at you know, massive uh, um, inequalities between Northern Europe and Southern Europe in terms of uh, um, socioeconomic disparities. And that really is very worrying in terms of you know, how do we bridge this gap uh, within the e European project. So th there are major challenges that the EU is facing. Um, the German elections not going to alter anything all that much. We're still left with the same scenario we were before German voters go to the polls on Sunday. Can we end on an optimistic note? Is there anything that we can look forward to then? Yeah, we can. I think I can, I can just bring in, I suppose, you know, the, the, there is, you know, Europeans are very enthusiastic about TTIP. You know, this is the only show in town that has huge enthusiasm for negotiating this with the Americans. Obama's enthusiastic. The Europeans are enthusiastic. We're hoping for um, a quick turnaround so we can get this, 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 this trade agreement, you know, up and running and see results soon. So that, that is really uh, one, one important light at the end of the tunnel. And then Europe is negotiating free trade agreements with Canada, with other European, with other uh, non-EU countries. So that's, that's, yeah, there's optimism there as well. Yeah. I, lo I know the Americans love optimism, so yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah this can-do attitude, which I adore. Uh, so I, will, I, can end a, I can end on a high, yeah, and pretend to be. Believe it. Excellent. Well, I'll believe it. Okay, great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciated you speaking to our audience. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day in Bloomington. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Will let up. Yeah. Oh, I hope so as well. Yeah. I hope <laughs> the sun comes out at some stage. Yeah. That's it for this edition of Cyber Focus. If you have any comments or suggestions for future topics, you can reach us at ciber at indiana.edu. Thank you.